Music for our invitation. They'll be my backup. I'll be down front. They'll be the backup. <laughs> I'm thankful. If you missed the last uh, message, the first in the series, let me remind you there's a book out in the rotunda entitled Jesus Speaks to the Church. I know the author real well. I recommend it. <laughs> I pray that it will be a blessing to you if you've not already read the book. If you have, you know where we're going in the message today. Revelation, the second chapter, verses 8 through 11. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Let me remind you in this series, lest you have not read the book and you were not here for the first part of this seven-part series, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we find the Lord Jesus speaking to the seven churches of Asia Minor. We would call it the seven churches of the book of the Revelation. We see the pitiful church in Ephesus, the persecuted church in Smyrna, the popular church in Pergamon, the paganized church in Thyatira, the powerless church in Sardis, the preaching church in Philadelphia, the putrid church in Laodicea. And these seven churches indicate and represent the uh, dispensations from the church age to today. Each of these seven churches can be found in modicums around the world and in portions of what you find in America. And you see in this church that we're looking at today, the church at Smyrna, you will understand that it and the church at Philadelphia, the only two churches that the Lord Jesus Christ had no condemnation, no condemnation at all. Out of honor and recognition of the reading of the Word of God, let me invite us to stand together. As we stand and as uh, I read audibly, follow with me in your scripture silently. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say that they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. He that hath an ear to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, he, he that overcometh shall, no, shall, be not, shall not be hurt of the second death. Thank you, and you may be seated. If I pause sometimes in the reading, it's because my Bible is so marked up and highlighted in yellow. <laughs> I call it the yellow highlighted edition. <laughs> my bride said on one occasion you need to uh, have a fresh Bible to read, from, to read from. If I lose my Bible, I wouldn't be able to preach. <laughs> As we look at this text, as I call it, the persecuted church, we need to be reminded that we're in the state of persecution of the church this very day. We have now the disinformation board, or the truth ministry, as Orwell, the secularist, called it in his dystopian novel, 1984. He said that there will be a truth ministry where truth will be considered a lie and a lie will be considered truth. We find that today taking place, and we find the one that is in the crosshairs of the federal government today are those that are conservative Christian patriots in America. If you stand for truth, if you stand for thus saith the word of God, if we stand for what is right and what is wrong and stand for it without equivocation and without apology, we are viewed as being the disinformation people in America today. I find it disdaining that we have this taking place, but the conservatives, the faithful churches in America are under the pressure. Listen, faithful conservative churches in America today are under the pressure to embrace the sodomite lifestyle called the LGBTQ agenda. Churches today are under the, in the crosshairs of the federal government and many state governments that say that we need to comply with what is popular and what is considered politically correct today. The woke society 
In, this, in these days, the woke society, the cancel culture, have made the decision on what is right and what is wrong. And we as Christians are expected to comply with it, to celebrate it, and to even embrace it. I don't find anything in the Word of God that authorizes that for the Christian. But so many of the pop-up churches with the pop-up preachers with the cotton candy theology, the goosebump theology, and the voodoo theology all shaken together, all they talk about, as Max said not too many moments ago, uh, they're simply talking about the love of God. Well, God loves us, and as a result of His love, He chastens those that He loves, according to my scripture. We need to understand as Christians today that the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to the churches speaks to the churches even as we see it in society today. The pressure and the persecution to embrace all that is ungodly, all that is unholy is on the uh, top burner as we speak today. Many churches simply bow. In fact, I don't know of a denomination today that's not bowed to the pressure of the sodomite agenda and the murder by way of abortion agenda in our society today. Most of the churches today, every denomination in some fashion, even those that were the last holdouts, the Southern Baptist Convention, embrace the LGBTQ. The past president of Southern Baptist Convention, Dr. J.D. Greer, said to the people, the pastors, the preachers, the delegates at the convention just a couple of years back, and it's on the YouTube unless they've taken it down that you can listen to the message. He says that we need to embrace the LGBTQ, bring them into our churches, give them opportunity to serve Jesus, and love them. I didn't hear, oh me. That's where we are in our society today. And we find in this text the Lord Jesus speaking to the church that I call the persecuted church. You see, unlike the church of Ephesus, who had left their first love, the church at Smyrna was a church pulled apart by pressure and poverty and persecution, and yet they were faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe we're in the era today that the churches need to recognize that if we stand for truth, if we stand for that which is conservative central biblicist theology, we're going to be persecuted, and yes, even to the point of prosecuted in the future days. But that does not give us leave to dismiss the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inert word of God without equivocation. As I have said before, and I say off times on the broadcast each day, I believe it's time preachers grow a spiritual spine and stand for the truth of the word of God, whether they are popular or not, whether they fill the pews or not. We need to stand for the truth of the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inert word of God. As we look at this text that is before us today, the persecuted church, I want us to notice three things that I believe are relevant in what we need to understand in our text that is before us. I believe we'll see the, uh, the destination of the communication recorded. We see the diagnosis of the church reveal, reviewed and the directive to the church revealed. Notice in verse 8 the destination of the communication recorded. Notice the scripture says, and unto the angel, that's the word angelos, the messenger. If you go back to chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, you find that the angelos, the messenger, is spoken of here as none other than the pastor of the local New Testament church. The church at Smyrna Wright. Again, we see the letter is not directed to the board of directors of the church. The letter is not uh, directed to the Sunday school teachers or the uh, deacons or the uh, trustees or any other uh, group that feel today, in most cases, they are in charge of the church, not the pastor. It's addressed to the pastor. So often we find today, ladies and gentlemen, uh, churches that have the idea that they need to be popular and they need to operate like a corporate entity. You know, a corporate entity has a board of directors. The board of directors tells the CEO what he can do, what he can't do, and what he should do, and what he should not do. We find so many of our churches today, in fact, you find it very popular in, uh, in uh, the Baptist churches where there's a mi mindset to have business meetings. Business meetings. Board of directors meeting. <laughs> Maybe you'll understand it. A business meeting where you vote on what color of uh, carpet you have, what color walls you paint, whether you put screens in the doors or not, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Anytime there's a vote in the local New Testament church, it divides the church. If it's 10 to 1, 5 to 5, 7 to 3, it's still a divisive factor to vote on anything. It's left up to the pastor, which is the head under-shepherd under of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
not a board, not a chairperson, uh, not a group of deacons, not a group of those that are going to get on the telephone uh, on a Monday morning and have uh, a little chatting session about what the preacher ought to have done, what he ought not to have done. Somebody said telephone, telegraph, tell a woman. But anyway, a lot, of men do, a lot of men do the same thing in relationship to gossip and sowing discord in the local New Testament church. May I remind us, the New Testament church has as its head the Lord Jesus Christ. And under the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God via the Lord Jesus Christ, the pastor has the responsibility to make sure that what is taught, what is said, what is preached, and what is uh, carried out in the local New Testament church is based on the authority of the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. It's called having a central biblicist worldview. That's what God would have us to do. The letter that Jesus Christ has written to the seven churches, and yes, to the one at Smyrna that we're looking at today, was addressed to the local New Testament church's pastor because it's the pastor that's responsible for the spiritual leadership of the church. In fact, in uh, 1 Peter, the scripture is very, very clear in the text in relationship what the pastor is to do. The pastor in 1 Peter chapter 5 is to shepherd the flock of God. The word shepherd is the little Greek word poimanitate. It simply means to lead, to feed, to guide, to guard, to direct, to correct in everything that is done in the local New Testament church. It's the pastor's responsibility. The Lord Jesus Christ ordained it that way. The Bible is very, very clear in its presentation of that. I simply make the statement, God blesses the church where there's a pastoral leadership that's willing to stand on the truth of the Word of God without equivocation, without fear, and without favor. Not only we see the pastor, but notice the people of the church, that is the ecclesia, the called out ones, the congregation, the assembly of believers at Smyrna. May I remind us, Smyrna was founded as a Greek colony about 1,000 B.C., destroyed it 400 years later and rebuilt under, the, uh, under Alexander between 301 and 281 B.C. It became a matter of pride by the, uh, those that were living in uh, the city. It became a matter of pride for them because the church, uh, had, the city had died and uh, was alive again, and it was called by some the glory of Asia. It was at Smyrna that Caesar worship was centered all over the eastern part of the Roman Empire. Smyrna is about 35 to 40 miles north of Ephesus. It also is a seaport city located on the main highway. Smyrna was perhaps a, uh, a safe city because it was viewed that it was a harbor city and most convenient for those that were in shipping in that era of that day. By the way, just simply to let you see and understand and get a little glimpse of the conditions in Smyrna, let me just give you a little statistical data in relationship to it. Smyrna was a city of temples, the temple of Zeus, the head of the gods, the temple of Apollo, the god of manly beauty, the temple of Diana, a fertility goddess, the temple of Aphrodite, a sex goddess, a, the temple of uh, Eclipus, that is the god of healing, symbolized by the snake coiled around the pole. Smyrna had a very large stadium, the stadium of Polycarp, where Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, and students of the apostle John were martyred for their faith, burned alive in A.D. 155. Smyrna means myrrh, but for the Christian, in all of the Christian literature as we read it, means suffering and persecution. Smyrna was one of the two churches, uh, the church at Smyrna and the church at Philadelphia, that the Lord Jesus Christ had no criticism and no condemnation for because of what was being preached and taught in the local New Testament church in that era in those churches. Both cities stand today, and I believe it's as a result of what you find in the Scripture in relationship to their willingness to stand for the truth of the Word of God and preach and teach the truth regardless of the condition of the city and the area around them. You could go back and find, based on the authority of biblical history, those things that were taking place in Smyrna, we can say very much like what we find in major metropolitan areas in America today, very much like our own city today, very much like major, major metropolitan areas in our nation today. And yet you find Smyrna, the church that was honoring God, the church that stood for truth and righteousness. Not only we see the pastor and the people, but I want us to notice the power. I want us to notice the power. These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. 
we see a twofold description of the Lord Jesus. As I've said before, each of the seven churches, when the one that is communicating, the communicator, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, in the introductory portion of the text, the Lord Jesus gives a little further information about his attributes and his character and characteristics. And here, and it's based, by the way, on what he's about to say to the church that he is addressing in that epistle and that particular letter. I want us to understand we see two-fold description of the Lord Jesus. First of all, we see that he is sovereign, that he is sovereign. The Scripture says, the first and the last, Jesus is saying, I am God. I am in control. I am in charge, even of the persecuted church at Smyrna. I believe we live in an era that we falter and we fall and we fail because we fail to recognize that regardless of what's happening in our society, regardless of what the cognitively depleted Joe, Sleepy Joe says out of the Oval Office, regardless of what the Socialist, Marxist, Communist, BLM, Democratic Party says, that Jesus Christ is still sovereign. He's still on the throne. He's still overall. He has not died. He's not gone on vacation. He's not even had COVID. <laughs> I want us to understand that Jesus Christ is speaking of himself when he says that he is sovereign. He says, persecuted church, don't you worry, don't you fret. The resurrected, exalted, glorified, unveiled Lord Jesus Christ is the one that's in authority and that's in control. I don't know about you, but I rejoice. I've said before it could make a Baptist costal, Baptist costal out of us all if we realize who Jesus Christ is and his authority and his power. He says, I'm the first and the last. And everything in between. I'm the Alpha and the Omega and everything in between. Jesus is saying, I'm sovereign. I'm in control. So church at Smyrna, you're persecuted and prosecuted, but I want you to understand that I'm on the throne. I'm in control. You need not worry. You need not fret. I'm sovereign. I'm God. Not only he says he's sovereign, but he says he's Savior. Was dead and is alive. You look at the Greek text, it's the two, little two-cylinder words, I call it, uh, geno, meno. It is simply passing, it's a passing phrase. Jesus says, I pass through death, but I'm alive. I'm alive. We serve a risen Savior. He's alive today. He's, a well, he's well today. And I think that often because of what we see happening in society, what we see with the denigration and the uh, destruction of what is called biblical Christianity today and morals and ethics and values seemingly have dissipated in our society, somehow, some way, we feel forlorn and we need to just toss in the towel and give it up. Jesus Christ says, I'm the Savior. I'm alive. Look to me, church at Smyrna. Jesus is saying, to the church at Smyrna, I've conquered death. All that threatens you right now, I already have victory over. Don't be fearful of the pressure. Don't be frightened of the problems. Don't be concerned about the pain and the persecution. I am on the throne. I am sovereign. I am Savior. I am in control. One of the things that I believe is so needful and necessary in society today among those that call themselves Christians is to recognize that Jesus Christ is sovereign, that Jesus Christ is Savior. The question is, do you know him as Savior? Have you said yes to him as Savior and as Lord? Have you said, Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner on my way to a devil's hell. Right now, I surrender to you. I invite you, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and save me. If that's never happened in your life, you're seated here today or beyond these walls, lost, lost, lost as a pretend Christian. And there are multitudes today that fall into that category that need to know Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. May I remind us, Jesus says, I've overcome death and the grave. We serve a risen Savior. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, some of my favorite texts uh, in verses 55 and following. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That should challenge and encourage every child of God is to recognize that regardless of what's happening in society, regardless of what's taking place in the dark days, that Jesus Christ is Savior. He is Savior. He is Lord. 
Kyrios owner, master, controller. We just simply need to submit and surrender to his lordship each and every day. May I remind us, not only we see the destination of the communication recorded, but notice in that ninth verse, the diagnosis of the church reviewed. Notice, first of all, the perception. We've just said Jesus is Savior. Jesus is sovereign. He is all-seeing. He is all-knowing. There's nothing hidden before him. He knows exactly what he says. I know thy works. Jesus says, I know. Comes the little word gnosis. Jesus says, I am all-seeing. I'm all-knowing. I'm ever-present. I'm omnipresent. I'm all-powerful. Jesus says, I know thy works. We need to understand what Jesus is saying to the church at Smyrna. He's saying, nothing is hidden from my all-knowing, all-seeing, ever-present eye. What we do, what we say, where we go, our motives and our attitudes, our deeds are all an open book before the all-seeing eye of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is getting to the point of saying to the uh, church at Smyrna, he says, I know your works, your deeds, I know what you're doing, I know how you're involved, etc., etc." But he says, I understand it because I know it and I see it in the persecution and the problem that you're faced with. Jesus knows every problem, every pain, and every pressure, and every heartache, and every detail of those perilous times that we're in today that Paul talked about in 2 Timothy. The scripture says in that text with the Apostle Paul, perilous times shall come. The word perilous means dark, dangerous, devastating, difficult, and deadly. We are in those days today. And Jesus speaking to the church here at Smyrna, he says, I see what's happening. There's an old song that says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And I believe we as Christians today are living beneath our privilege because we fail to carry it to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, asking Him to see and know and intervene in our daily life and what we're doing and what we're saying and where we're going. We fail to take it to the Lord in prayer. As a result of that, we face difficulties and problems in our lives, each and every one of us. Not only we see the perception, but notice the pressure. Jesus says, I know thy works and tribulation. The word tribulation, there's the little word, the lipsis. It simply says affliction, pressure, distress, anguish, and problems. Jesus says, I know your works. I know your pursuits. I know what you're doing. I know your intention as a church. He says, but also know your pain and your pressure and the labor that you go through in carrying out the task. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, understand that being a Christian is not an easy life. The very moment we say yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, Satan is on the attack and will face his fiery darts of the wicked one until face to face we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ in glory. Jesus says, I know the pressure and the pain and the problems you're faced with. I know what you are doing and the difficulties that you're faced with. He is saying, if you'd allow me with the young blood vernacular as a little parenthetical footnote to that statement, Jesus is saying, dear church at Smyrna, I recognize that you're doing the good deeds, you're doing the work, but at the same time, I know the pressure and the pain and the problem and the uh, persecution that you're faced with just in simply carrying out the task that I've assigned you to do. That ought to be a lesson and a message to everyone under the sound of my voice of what is taking place and that Jesus sees it. They had refused, by the way, as a little historical footnote to that, they had refused to worship emperor as God. The Christians were being considered disloyal to the government. You hear that? The Christians were considered to be disloyal to the government because they refused to say emperor is Lord. They refused to bow and submit to the government of that day. They refused to submit to the thugs with badges, as I call it, in the society that we're faced with today. They refused to say right is wrong and wrong is right, as was demanded of them then. They refused to do so. And Jesus says, I know that. I know that you're in that position, and I understand what you're faced with, and I understand your pain of being tortured and tormented and thrown into prison and burned in boiling oil and uh, burned at the stake. Some were crucified, thrown to the lions in the Colosseums, martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. 
We've not reached that depth and breadth and plummeted to the bottom of the pit, as some would call it today. But we're on the fast track for it. If Jesus tarries, if the rapture tarries, we're going to face what this church faced called Smyrna. We're going to face the persecution, the problems, and the pain if we stand for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May I say to us today, we live in a state of comfort in society as compared with what others are faced with around the globe at this very hour. May I remind us some relevant headlines about that very thing. Here's a headline that says, U.S. City launches a serious attack on traveling Christian evangelist." The state of Colorado already has a well-established reputation for attacking Christians. A few years back, one civil rights commissioner in public meeting likened them, the Christians, to Nazis in society. Then the state was publicly rebuked by the U.S. Supreme Court for its hostility to Christianity in the case involving Christian baker Jack Phillips at the Masterpiece Cake Shop. And now one of the state cities, Pueblo, is facing a court case over its decision to discontinue any roving Christian evangelist in their city. Those who travel from city to city in RVs delivering revival messages must cease, according to the ruling for that city. Here's another article. Pro-abortion mob looking to storm churches just got a wake-up call from the state attorney general amid threats to the Catholic churches and pro-abortion forces that have been enraged that the Supreme Court would perhaps overturn Roe versus Wade. Goes on to talk about the Christian attorney, uh, the uh, Virginia attorney general has says it won't happen in Virginia. By the way, I'm thankful for Youngkin that was elected uh, uh, the governor of Virginia. Virginia has been the basement state of the nation when it comes to morals and ethics and values and the right of parents to know what's being taught to their kids in the public school system. That's all changing now because of that. This is further in the article. He says, the federal law makes it a felony to intimidate, interfere with, or obstruct any person who is seeking to exercise his or her First Amendment right of religious freedom at a place of religious worship. Virginia criminal law prohibits obstruction, prohibits the obstruction to the free movement of others and trespassing on church property or obstructing proper ingress or egress to the church. Most are not aware of the fact that it's a federal law for any human being to walk into a church at a worship service and try to interfere or interrupt or in some way intimidate because the stand that the church takes. Here's an article. The left is at war with the with Christian America for decades, but now they finally decided, declared, it is open warfare. I'm sure that you're aware the Supreme Court leak that revealed the majority would, are prepared to overturn Roe versus Wade and bring the issue of abortion back to the state. Roe versus Wade was one of the left's most significant victories, not just their, their war on Christianity, but their war on truth. And now, that's in jeopardy. The left is preparing its most vicious attack on churches in decades. Another article reads, As hideous as it gets, a top Christian sounds warning over the deranged left and their movement against the church. This is from Dr. James Dobson. With leftists in America suffering from Roe versus Wade derangement syndrome, the time is pressing forward for the fight against abortion is now, according to Dr. James Dobson. Further, he says, recently the left has become increasingly deranged over the potential of Roe versus Wade being overturned. From riotous mobs outside the homes of the Supreme Court justices to uh, pre, uh, pro, uh, pro-abortion activists, defacing churches across the country in violation to all federal law. Further, he says, more now, more than ever before, God-fearing and life-loving Americans must let their voices be heard without any delay. Another article says, City of Haven to remove In God We Trust from police cars. Last week, during the city council meeting in Haven, Kansas, city council members voted on removing In God We Trust decals from the police vehicles. Council member Sandra Sandra Williams introduced the measure by emphasizing that she did not think that the police department was proper a f- proper forum to even talk about God. After a brief discussion, Williams made a motion to remove In God We Trust decals from all police vehicles in their city, as well as deleting any Bible verses from any police department's Facebook pages. Another council member seconded the motion, and it passed unanimously in the city, end quote. 
the price America is paying for rejecting God. The action of the secular left is pushing God out of the culture have resulted in tragic consequences. Further, the article states, these tragic consequences have left Americans wondering what is happening in our country. The tragedies you are seeing nightly on the news and read about it in your morning newspaper are happening in our country, that, in our country because we've rejected God. What you will see around, around you every day is what a godless society looks like and is growing worse by the day. Here's an article about the U.K. Perhaps you have heard the material on it. I've touched on it in the broadcast several occasions. The crime of quoting Scripture. Wow, this is hard to believe. Uh, threatened with prison sentences and fines for quoting the Scripture. Let me tell you the story of this brave woman. Her name is uh, Pavia Rasanin, is a medical doctor, is married to a pastor who is also the principal of the Finnish Lutheran Mission Bible College. She's been a member of the parliament in Finland for 27 years, has served the country of Finland as the minister of interior, is the mother of five adult children, the grandmother of ten. And fasten your seatbelts, what recently charged, was recently charged with a crime, taken to court and threatened with prison sentence and a massive fine. What was her crime? She quoted Romans 1, 24 through 27, which refers to homosexuality and a post about the compromising and capitulating bishop, bishop of her denomination. And it goes on to talk about the fact that she was tried for that. Ultimately, what we would call our Supreme Court, the high court there, ruled that they could not prosecute her simply for exercising her speech. Franklin Graham warns, and I quote, Progressive uh, Christianity is sending, Christ is sending people to hell. The article states, Decision Magazine, uh, but bluntly condemned, from Decision Magazine, bluntly condemned progressive Christianity as something that could send people to hell. And it goes further. The problem, he explained, is that prog uh, progressive script, uh, Christianity denies the divinity, divinely inspired authoritative truth of the Bible as it intersects with the facets of living. For example, all the scripture clearly says that marriage is between one man and one woman. Proponents of the progressive Christianity twist and distort the truth of God's word on sexuality, focusing on such nonsensical trends as gender identity. He continued, they deny God's distinction of sexes and instead invent their own misguided standards, uh, unguided by the word of God. The degrading uh, culture influences that embrace the movement as gay marriages have, uh, a, have a sway on their beliefs that differs from the beliefs and the teachings of the Word of God. Pastor Andrew Brunson, most of you perhaps have heard of him, incarcerated in 2016 in Turkey because of being a Christian pastor. America, the American pastor who was in prison for two years in Turkey on false charges is warning Christians in the United States that in an environment of increasing hosti hostility, they need to prepare to face the kind of persecution experienced by fellow Christians around the world. Further, he says, first, the exclusively, exclusivity of Jesus in salvation, that Jesus is the only way to God. Second, that Jesus demands obedience from his followers in a number of areas that are hotly contested in the culture today, such as sexual morality, gender identity, marriage, family life, Bible, biblical justice, those who are faithful to Jesus in upholding the gospel exclusively and obedience to Christ are going to be labeled as evil people, we already call domestic terrorists. And those who persecute us will justify themselves by saying that we are people of hate and that we carry a message of hate. Pastor Brunson said, quote, the majority, listen to this, the majority of believers are not ready in America to face the pressures and the persecutions that's coming upon us, end quote. I don't have any greater words of warning than could come from his pen in warning us, we as Christians, as to what is coming in our nation in persecution. We see the persecution, we see uh, the, the perception that is, and we see the pressure. But I want you to notice the poverty that's spoken of in this text. Notice what the Lord Jesus says to the church at Smyrna about that. He's talking about now you're going to face persecution, pressure, and problems. But notice what he says in that text. And poverty, but thou art rich. Listen to what Jesus says about the church at Smyrna, the persecuted church. Jesus is saying poverty. It is the word pina, the little Greek word pina, means totally without, 
totally bankrupt. Jesus says to the church at Smyrna, I know your works. I know your persecution. I know the pressure. I know the problems. But I also know that you're living in poverty, and yet you're faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somehow we've reached the uh, denigrative law in America that says that if you have massive buildings and tremendous uh, uh, facilities and all kinds of wow programs, that somehow that's indicative of spirituality. That is not the case at all. And Jesus deals with it not only here, but in other of the churches, of the seven churches that he speaks to. These are living in poverty. One of the reasons they're suffering is because of their, first of all, their recognition their recognition. They were despised and disdained because of their insignificance. They met in caves. They met in homes. And most of the uh, folks in Smyrna that were religious people had the huge idol-worshiping shrines, a huge impressive towering temples to the gods and the goddesses of that day. And as a result of that, these that are viewed as insignificant, minuscule, and having no value whatsoever. Jesus says, I recognize your pressure and the problems. I realize your poverty and that you're still carrying out the task that I've called you to, regardless of being uh, financially bankrupt in society as society sees it. The Christians were simply viewed as being nobodies. When I was growing up, we were poor. The poor folks in our community recognized and called us poor. <laughs> but yet there's a mindset today that if it's a small church, a small ministry, one with uh, a few coins, that somehow, way, you're insignificant and have no value. We have grown to that state or devolved to that state in American Christianity today. It's all about numbers, nickels, and noses with the pop-up churches and the pop-up pastors with the uh, voodoo theology. You know, the cotton candy theology, it tastes good, but it's not filling. The goosebump theology, it makes you feel good, but it has nothing to do with what God's Word says. That's what is promulgated in society today. Jesus says to the church there at Smyrna, I recognize where you are. I understand the difficulties you're faced with, and I recognize that. He also talks about not only uh, their rejection, but he, don't, he talk, they talks about their uh, riches. Thou art rich. Listen, he says, you don't have any money. You're bankrupt financially, but you're wealthy in my sight. Listen to what God counts as being wealth. So often a church, just like society in general, will consider money in the bank as being a validity or a point of val a validation of what the church stands for and what you are. Most in society today have that mindset. Most in society today, it is the numbers, nickels, and noses mindset that you see in the churches, but most in society today feel that somehow, some way, if I have a thick bank account, if I have my 401k all uh, up to par, by the way, that's coming to a screeching halt. I'm not a prophet, not son of a prophet. But may I say in my most humble opinion, based on all the indicators that we see, by the first quarter of next year, we're going to find major calamity. We've already watched it go from about 35,000 on the stock market to about 31,000. And I contend there's about another 20,000. It's nothing but hot air in the balloon. We've already watched the Bitcoin, the uh, fake phony coin system that has lost 50% of its value in the past week alone. By the way, there's a motive behind that. Nancy Pelosi and AOC and the other three, along with the executive order of Sleepy Joe, there's a movement in the beltway of Washington today to introduce what is called the Fed coin. That's fiat money. And when that comes online, you, the greenbacks will be considered of no value, just like the Confederate money was a number of years ago. When that happens, you will have your cell telephone, and all of your money will be on that cell telephone. And if you're not a good boy, if you don't have the social scores they're doing in China today, then all the federal government's got to do is press the button and you're cut off from society, cut off from what you can buy, sell, or trade, fulfilling what we see now in a glimmer on the stage as the stage is being set of Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 18, when the Antichrist, the lawless one, the man of sin, steps on the scene. You can't buy, sell, or trade lest you have the mark. I'm here to say to us today, ladies and gentlemen, it's time we as Christians recognize that our wealth is not based on the pocketbook or the checkbook. It's based on what was laid up for ourselves in heaven where moth and rust cannot uh, corrupt and where thieves cannot break through and steal. That's the only value that the Lord Jesus Christ sees 
and he's speaking to the church at Smyrna, and he's saying to them that you're wealthy, you're rich. May I say to you, there's an old song George Beverly Shea uh, originated and did so well with it for so many years. I'd rather have Jesus and silver and gold. I'd rather have uh, Jesus and wealth untold. And may I say to you today, that ought to be our aspiration, our goal, our aim, our ambition, is to be wealthy in Jesus, not in what is found in the society today in which we're living. During the Great Depression, the story is told of a Christian who in previous years prior to the Depression had given away large sums of money and uh, large sums of money going to the Lord's work. And now he's destitute. By economic standards, everything had collapsed. And he was asked the question, listen carefully. He was asked the question by a fellow uh, citizen that was a friend of his. said, aren't you sorry that now that you gave so much of your money away? And he said, oh, no, no, no. He said, because after all, that's all I really have today is what I've given away. For the Lord, the Christians at Smyrna had nothing but in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was wealth untold. May I say to us, they had invested their treasures in heaven, and that's where our treasures ought to be today. You may own it all, you may have millions, you may have title deed to uh, acres and acres and acres of property, but without the Lord Jesus Christ, you're broke, have no value at all. The perception, the pressure, the poverty, but notice the persecution in the ninth verse. And I know the blasphemy of the, them which say that they are Jews and are not, but are in the synagogue of Satan. Literally, notice two things about the persecution that's found. First of all, it's slanderous, and secondly, it's satanic. It's slanderous, and it's satanic. Blasphemy, revealing the maliciousness, the bitterness, the evil words, the slander about the Christians at Smyrna. Harsh, bitter words about the Christians at Smyrna. The pagan Jews and the Greeks of the city abhorred these poor, simple believers. We need to be careful of pride, spiritual pride. And then we'll forget been 35 plus years ago. By the way, Brother Max, I heard somebody say when you said you're just turning 70, he's still a kid. <laughs> no, I just, that came to me. <laughs> Never will forget many years ago, knocking on a door, we had teams going out, knocking on doors, sharing the gospel, passing out tracts. First started the ministry, we sent out 106,000 pieces of printed literature and material, notifying all in the community what we were doing. Knocked on one door, and the dear lady said, I have you know we're members of the First Baptist Church. Slam. Now, I'm not saying that to condemn First Baptist Church. I'm saying that to say that somehow, some way, we've developed a mentality in Christianity today that the size of the church is indicative of our spirituality and our piousness. There's a mindset somehow that bigger is always better in relationship to it. And I'm not talking about John Morgan and his ambulance chasing outfit. I'm talking about the fact that bigger is not necessarily better. It has no connotation of what is spirituality in the life and the heart of the believer. Christian Baker and florist business uh, owners are being persecuted today. The LGBTQ agenda uh, and the pressure and the prosecution as a result of that we find taking place across our nation today. We see Jesus says, first of all, it's slanderous, and secondly, it's satanic. Of them which say, notice which say, they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. You see, the slander is from a group of pretenders. The slander comes from a group of those which say that they are of a uh, particular denomination or a particular group or a particular belief system. The synagogue, the assembly, the congregation of Satan, Jesus says. Some of these Jewish pretenders were perhaps attending the church. They professed to be worshiping God, but Jesus says they're in the service of Satan, carrying out Satan's agenda. I made a little marginal note. Be careful. Satan will use any available vessel to distress and to persecute and to tear down and destroy the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will use any vessel to sow seed of discord and division in the body of Christ. Whether it's in the local New Testament church or on a national level. It was U.S. Representative Jerry Nadler when they were debating on the floor 
about House Bill 5, which would have codified the LGBTQ agenda and would have made it hate speech if anybody had said anything publicly or produced and printed or uh, distributed anything that's against the LGBTQ. And so one of the legislators was standing at the speaker's stand reading Scripture in relationship to what God says. Jen Adler cut him off and said, I have you know that God's Word has no place in the halls of Congress. That's where we are in society today. That's where we are in our nation today. And that's what we see taking place here in this text. Be very, very careful. These so-called Jewish converts were Satan's tools. Satan's tools. Not only do we see the destination of the communication recorded and the diagnosis of the church review, but I want you to notice the directive to the church revealed in verse 10 and 11. Notice, first of all, the prohibition. I like this. It speaks volumes to us today. Jesus says, fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Jesus says the problem of poverty, the problem of persecution, the problem of what is taking place in your church today, that you're suffering for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, stop being afraid. Do not be fearful. Do not have anxiety and worry in relationship to that. Jesus says, and by the way, it's in the imperative voice, it is a command. Stop being afraid of these things which thou shalt, that's positive, thou shalt suffer. Jesus says, behold, the devil shall, that is positive, cast some of you believers in prison. You would have thought Jesus wrote these words yesterday to churches in America today and churches around the world in these moments. Notice the sure persecution. Jesus said, some of you will be thrown into prison for your faith, for serving Jesus, for being faithful, for refusing to practice emperor worship, for refusing to embrace the sodomite lifestyle, for refusing to embrace the Islamics that are coming in. By the way, in my book, Is, Islamic, is Islam Tolerant? The answer is no. It is quiet today. It's the magic hand of the magician in the Oval Office and his puppeteers that says, don't pay attention to the right hand while I'm carrying out what I want to do with the left. We have more Islamics in control of seats of authority in our nation today in every state and on the federal level than in the history of the United States of America. Australia, with all of its faults and frailties, will not allow an Islamic to run for public office. You read my book, Is Islam Tolerant? You will find that I state, and I do so with research authority, in any city, in any state, in any nation, where an Islamic reaches the realm of 3 to 6%, they rise up and take total, absolute control. If you don't believe that, you look at what's happening in Michigan today. You look at what is happening in the major cities in Michigan today. One of the major cities in Michigan at this very moment, the city council is made up of Islamics. The chief police is Islamic. The mayor of the city is Islamic. It is, we're on the fast track for that. Jesus is saying to this church, don't pay any attention to it. Don't worry about it. Just keep on keeping on. Keep your eyes on the prize at the end of the goal that the apostle Paul talked about in uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 8. I have fought a good fight, I have kept the forth, and kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, that the righteous judge shall give to me, but not to me only, but to all of them that love his appearing. May I say to us today, there is the sure persecution. The charge of hate crime is spreading against uh, Christians today, speaking against any of these things that we find today that's politically correct. 32-page document promulgated out of the Department of Justice under the auspices and the leadership and directions of Merrick Garland, the Attorney General, passed on to the FBI that will cause every mother, every dad that stands before a school board and challenges the CRT and the sodomite lifestyle that's being taught and the abortion uh, activists that are being taught in the classroom, pure, raw pornography being taught in the classroom. Those will be considered domestic terrorists, but don't stop there. I read the 32-page document. If you're a Christian, a Christian Republican that voted for Donald Trump, you are probably a domestic terrorist. And even though the DOJ said they did not do so, that is a factual lie. 
It was transmitted to the FBI. It is now being carried out. And moms across America, mama bears as they're called, are now being persecuted and prosecuted simply because of standing up for their son and daughter in the public, governmentally controlled, garbage, indoctrination, brainwashing system that's called public education. The sheer persecution. One day will this will happen in America. The Bible ultimately will be outlawed. Prayer, the crosses, and the uh, Ten Commandments are all now illegal for the most part across the nation. Not only the sheer persecution, but notice the sovereign purpose. That ye may be tried. May be tried. When you look at the Greek text, the word for tried, for temptation, for trial, and for testing, all the same Greek word. Context demands an explanation. Jesus says that you may be tried. The word there is tested. Jesus doesn't promise that we're going to have easy living because we're safe. Jesus says that we're going to be tested and proven in society. The faith that falters before the finish had a fatal flaw at the first. You know what I mean? There are a lot of folks that will start out in a 440 relay and they don't get the 100, 100 yard dash before they step aside. Multitudes today, the oh, how I love Jesus on Sunday, Monday through Saturday, they act like an emissary of the devil himself. There's a mindset somehow, some way in society today that says that we are to live uh, prosperous lives. You have the lie of Joyce Myers. You have the lies of Joel Osteen. You have the deception of T.D. Jakes. And I could go on and on and on. Rick Warren that embraces and has the Islamics to come in and do the Islamic call to prayer from his pulpit. You have all of this taking place today, and somehow, some way, there's a mindset that it's okay. They're doing that to avoid that trying and that testing and that proving. You can take gold and until it is passed through the crucible and it comes to a boiling point and you scrape the slag off the top, you have pure gold that's left. That is the testing of the gold. The Lord Jesus says for the child of God, for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we shall be tested. It's the refining of the faith. It's refining us that everything that doesn't look like Jesus will be removed. Perhaps you heard the story of this old boy that was the janitor. He'd come in at night. He'd clean the studio up. It was an art studio. And the artist, sculptor, was, had a giant square of pink marble on the table. And he'd chisel away at that all day. And the cleanup man would come in at night. And he'd clean it all up and have it all prepared for the next day. And finally... Months had passed, and the sculptor walks in, and uh, there's Charles over on the, nobody named Charles, I hope. <laughs> Charles is over on the couch, asleep. And the sculptor shakes him and wakes him up and says, uh, what are you doing here? And he said uh, that he'd just fallen asleep. And he sat up, and he says, how did you know a horse was in that square of marble? He said, the sculptor says, very easy. I just chiseled away everything that didn't look like a horse. What the Lord Jesus Christ is doing in your life and in my life is testing us, chiseling away everything that does not look like and mirror the image of Jesus Christ himself. We are predestined to conform to the image of Christ. We're not predestined to heaven, as the lies of John Calvin would have you to believe. We're predestined to conform to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the sheer persecution. The sovereign purpose is that we will be disciplined to the point of saying yes to Jesus and serving him. There are about uh, three or four reasons, three reasons in particular for discipline or for the testing. First of all is to discipline. Hebrews 12, 6 says, says in the text, Therefore whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and encourageth every son whom he receiveth. The second reason is direction. The apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh. God used that thorn in the flesh to keep the apostle Paul close to himself, using and directing him to serve him. The third thing is for dedication. Jesus told Paul, I will show you what things you must suffer for my name's sake. Acts chapter 9, verse 16. Our trials and our testing is to draw us closer to the Lord Jesus Christ, that he might prove us and try us that we might be refined and be his servants in surrendering him. Notice, not only do we see the sheer persecution and the sovereign purpose, but notice the set period. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Now, there have been a multitude of theologians that have struggled with that ten days 
over the period of years. Jesus is in control, and Jesus says, listen, the time frame of this suffering and the persecution in perspective of eternity is minuscule. It's small, infinitesimal. Jesus says, don't you worry. Don't you fret. Don't you be frightened. Don't you be afraid. What you're walking through now is a limited time of Jesus Christ's test in our lives to refine us and mold us and make us. Jesus said the pressure and the pain and the problems and the persecution would be literally a brief set period of time. The duration of our persecution and pain and problem is in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He knows how much is enough to accomplish his purpose. He knows how much is enough to get our attention. A number of years ago, after having gone through what the doctors thought was a heart attack, my wife said at least the doctors found I had a heart, but anyway, <laughs> she didn't really say that. <laughs> and then later suffering with what the doctor said that I was going blind. Never will forget walking out into our front yard back in Georgia. The azaleas were in full blossom. They looked to be more beautiful in color than I'd ever seen. But I said, Lord, I'll preach for you blind if you want me to. But I'd sure rather have my eyesight. God answered that prayer. The ophthalmologist, the ophthalmologist at the University of Miami, after two days of excruciating examination, he said, by the time you're 75 years old, you should be able to pick up the newspaper and read it as well as you do today. At first, he asked the question after the two days exam, why are you here? What's the problem? I said, Doc, I thought you could tell me. He said, I find nothing. God had healed my eyes. And the answer to that little simple prayer. He knew exactly what it would take. Because, you see, I had gone 13 years trying to serve him bivocationally when he had called me full time. He knows how to get our attention. He knows what's needed to refine and mold and make us the instrument, the vessel that he would have us to be. That tenth verse, the latter portion, he says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Notice the, our counsel and our crown. Be thou faithful unto death. Listen very carefully. It's not the wealth untold that's needed. It's not uh, the abilities of man. It's not the... Uh, sights that is seen today and viewed as being pious and spiritual. It's simply faithfulness. It's required under stewards to be found faithful, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians, to be found faithful. That's what God calls on for you and for me. That's what Jesus Christ is saying to the church that is before us. He's simply saying you're going to go through pain and persecution and problems and difficulties and you're in poverty. But I want you to keep on keeping on, church. I want you to keep on keeping on being faithful and serving me. Don't falter and don't fail and don't fall. Go back to the book of Daniel. The three Hebrew boys. They didn't bow. They didn't bend. When they were thrown in the fire furnace, they didn't burn. That's what God calls on for you and for me. Is simply be faithful. Whatever gifts, talents, and abilities we have, they're God's, not ours. They're on loan from God. Whatever we have as far as abilities, if it's singing, if it's teaching, if it's preaching, if it's soul winning, evangelism, whatever gifts, talents, and abilities he's given us, he wants us to be found faithful. And that's the counsel he's giving to the church. We may once again need to die for our faith in America. The question is, are you willing we have the attacks on America, the attacks on the Christian church in America. We have the attacks on prayer and Bible reading. May I say to us, we need to be faithful regardless of what's happening. Not only we see the, our counsel, but notice our crown. Jesus says, and I will give thee a crown of life. 
a crown of life. It's Stephanos, it's the victor's crown. It's the crown that we receive for running the race and not stumbling and not falling. And if we stumble and fall, we get up and run again and keep on running. Two football coaches were debating what makes a good football player. One told them, and said, every time your man gets out on the field, he stumbles and falls. He said, but that's a good player. He said, it's a matter he gets up each time. A Christian in the race, we may stumble, we may fall, we may falter, but get up and keep on running in the race because there's a crown. And with that crown is well done, thou good and faithful servant that the Lord Jesus Christ will give to us. Second Corinthians, I'm sorry. We need to be looking at Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 8. The Apostle Paul says, I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the co my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. That same crown is available for you and for me today. It's the crown of life, the everlasting life. The world offers a reward in the famous games and athletic arenas of the day that this text was penned. And the crown was for the winner. And these crowns for the winners in the athletic arenas of that day would fail. They would absolutely fade away. And these crowns that the ones were winning in that era were flaunted in the faces of the poverty-stricken, persecuted church at Smyrna. But Jesus says, wait, keep on being faithful. You're going to get a crown, eternal crown, a crown that never fades. Notice the principle in that 11th verse. Jesus says, listen up. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Jesus says, listen. If you've got an ear, listen up. Understand what I'm saying. Jesus is saying, listen carefully to what I've just said. Tune in the ear and understand what I have just explained to you. The first death is our physical death. The second death is eternal separation from the Lord. Jesus Christ reminds us of the principle that the world lives to die, but the Christian dies to live. Our 56-year-old son, September of last year, entered the presence of the Lord Jesus. The well done, the good and faithful servant. I've told my bride several times I'm kind of jealous. He's already experienced the joy unspeakable. He's already run the race, been faithful to the end. Now he's in the presence of Jesus. That's what Jesus is saying to the church at Smyrna. He that overcometh. What does that mean? That you keep on keeping on. You might stumble and fall. There might be difficult and dark days. But you don't let that stop you from serving the Lord Jesus Christ. You keep on keeping on. Honoring him. Serving him. Surrendering to him. Jesus reminds us of that privilege that we have today to live for him and to ultimately die for him. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 and following, I'll read and we close. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death had no power. 
but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's pointing to the day in the millennial reign. And it goes beyond that millennial reign. For those that have said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, there's no second death. You see, ladies and gentlemen, for the Christian, to die is gain, the Apostle Paul said. We gain a better heritage, a better home, a better health. When we leave this life, listen very carefully as we close. Every heartbeat, every breath is on loan from God. All he needs to do is remove his hand from off our lives for a nanosecond. And we're cast out into eternity. Where will that eternity be? Do you have the assurance today? Do you know today, beyond a shadow of a doubt, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain? Do you have that assurance that if you were to die, you would spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ? We're going to have an invitation.